evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us for this webinar. My name is Siwan Howardson, and I'm a grass and forage scientist at AHDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar, Grassland Soil, Knowing What You've Got and How to Improve It, with Elizabeth Doctor. Tonight's webinar is being delivered as part of the GrassCheck DB project. GrassCheck DB is a collaboration between HCC, QMS, AHDB, together with CL, from Fed Research, AFI, and industry sponsors within the UK. This webinar has proved very popular with nearly 190 registrations. We will do our best to make sure everything runs smoothly, but please stay with us if you do run into any technical difficulties. You will also stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of the screen at any point during the webinar. We will do our best to cover all of your questions after the presentation. Before I introduce our main speaker today, I'm very pleased to invite Kat Newton, a grassland scientist at AFPI in Northern Ireland, to give a short introduction to the GrassCheck TV project and to set the scene for Elizabeth's presentation by highlighting some of the research that is ongoing at AFPI. Without further delay, it's over to you, Kat. Perfect. Thanks, Swan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I work on the Grass Check GB project and I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of that. I think most of you who've registered for the webinar have probably come across this before, but just in case there's anybody that's not seen too much of the project, um, just a quick recap. So we're a grass monitoring project involving 50 dairy, beef and sheep farms around the country. Um, and these farms are running a variety of different systems, but they're all operating on rotational grazing. We're man monitoring grass growth and quality through the growing season and publishing that data every week. And we also have the on-farm weather stations that are recording both weather and soil conditions. Uh, if you want to find out any more, you can check out the website or find us on Twitter. And we've also got a Facebook page that's just been set up the last couple of weeks. And that's grasscheck underscore GB. Uh, can you put my next slide up, Elizabeth? Uh, so if we look at some of the data that's come in from the 2020 grazing season so far, um, it's been a very variable season. So it started off incredibly wet in February and rapidly got very, very dry with the rainfall figures coming in through uh, the end of March, April, May and into June being significantly below what we'd be expecting to see for that time of the year. Uh, we've seen some very wet weather again in August and early September. So while the grass growth that we've been measuring over the last couple of weeks has been pretty reasonable and sort of comparable to what you'd expect in early autumn time, um, some of the wetter farms have seen sort of saturated soil conditions and that has caused a bit of difficulty in some areas and um, probably more so in the north of England than anywhere else at the moment. There is some regional variation and you can see on the bar graph on this slide um, differences in regional yields to date um, but overall we've got a total dry matter production uh, coming up to this week so from from when we recorded in the beginning of March up to now at 8.5 ton per hectare on average across the grass track GB network uh, that figures 1.2 ton behind where we were at this time in 2019 um, and that's nearly 1.7 ton behind the long-term average uh, the, so the dry summer conditions we had certainly have had an impact and they're probably what's driving those yields being slightly lower than typical. So you can see the dip in the grass growth curve on the other side of that slide here for April and May time and into June when you'd be typically seeing your peak grass growth for the season. Uh, can you pop the next slide please Elizabeth? So we're talking about soils today, so I just wanted to do a little bit of a run through of the soil monitoring that we've got as part of this project. All of our farms have the soil moisture and temperature probes fitted, and the moisture scale uh, runs from 0 to 200, with 0 being saturated soils and 200 being extremely dry. And those measurements are uh, resistance, uh, the unit centre bars, and they're effectively measuring how much uh, resistance there is to soil water uptake by the plant roots. Um, so through the peak of the season, we've been showing the soil moisture readings in the weekly bulletins, 
but at the start of the year and in the next couple of weeks we're going to be moving on to show soil temperature data because we're going to see sort of as the weather cools soil temperature becomes a limiting factor rather than moisture in terms of sort of in influencing grass growth at this time of the year um, but you can see on the graph on this slide just quite how dry this summer was in comparison to last year so the orange line on that graph is the soil moisture readings we recorded through 2019 as sort of weekly averages across all of our farms and the blue line is the 2020 figures so that really high number is showing uh, really dry soils as an average across the whole of the country um, the week the 25th of may and the beginning of june as well so the soil data that we're collecting as part of the grass check gb project with the moisture and the temperature readings it's obviously something that farmers don't have any control over um, but soil health and sort of soil nutrient state and status is something where there are a lot of practical steps that can be taken and um, so if you put the next slide up please elizabeth uh, i just wanted to show to you all some figures that have been produced by some research work done by colleagues in AFB here in Northern Ireland. And I want to thank Suzanne Higgins for providing me with the figures on this slide. And um, it's her and her team that have done this work. Um, but there's been some large scale soil survey work done by AFB looking into soil nutrient status on farms across Northern Ireland. And a couple of the key findings of that survey work was 25% of the soils here had a low potash status. And trials have shown that that can potentially impact yields by reducing yields by 20 to 30 percent which is obviously quite significant. Uh, they also found that 43 percent of soils sampled across Northern Ireland had a suboptimal pH so less than 5.3 so on peaty soils and less than six for most grassland soils. Um, there was some economic analysis done on these figures and they found that the benefits of applying lime, they estimated it would give a five-fold return on the investment if you were to go and correct that suboptimal soil pH. Um, the assumptions behind these calculations were that you were going to boost your dry matter production by a tonne per hectare per year over a five-year period, uh, simply by correcting the soil pH if there's no other limiting factors. And then we're valuing that additional grass dry matter production at £100 per tonne. Now, I know these figures are based on sort of the markets in Northern Ireland, but I'm sure they do translate across to GB farms, sort of not too far off as well. So there's quite clearly significant economic benefits that can be gained if soil testing is carried out and if sort of deficiencies and whatnot are corrected. Um, but only 10% of the farms that were, that were surveyed in this work actually had an up-to-date soil analysis. Uh, so I'm hoping that these figures really highlight the importance of looking after our soils and looking and monitoring the soil nutrient status um, because that's really providing the foundation to improving and maintaining your grassland production. Uh, and without further ado, I'll pass you back to Suan and Elizabeth for the rest of tonight's presentation. Thanks Kat, that was a really good highlight of what data is coming out of the GrassCheck DB project. Um, I will send a link to the GrassCheck DB um, webpage as well, so people can have a look at that um, in their own time. But without any further delay, I'm delighted to introduce our main speaker for tonight. Um, Elizabeth Stockdale has over 25 years of applied soil and nutrient management research experience, and has engaged with a wide range of research projects connected with the study of nutrient cycling in soil, and with the environmental impact of farming systems. Most, recent, most recently, she has been very active in developing farmer-focused approaches, measurement of soil health, and developing on-farm toolkits to improve soil management through the AHCB Soil Biology and Soil Health Research Programme. So without further delay, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's nice not to see you all, though um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're all sitting in a relaxed manner with a beer, perhaps, or, um, at your computer screen. Um, I'm going to just talk through some of the principles for managing healthy soils in the context of grassland management. And I've been specifically asked to talk about the basics of soil health and then focus on actually the links between soil physical, chemical and biological factors and how those suboptimal levels of nutrients or um, compaction can actually impact grass growth 
and then actually how we might go ahead and, and find approaches that really help sample properly and then um, address those problems going forward. We're going to focus a little bit more on on the how to measure than on how to fix because the how to fix is tricky because it's site specific and farm specific and knowing how to measure helps to put you on the right track for thinking about the kinds of approaches you might take but we'll we'll touch a lot on on how to fix things as we go through and i'm sure if you've got particular questions you'll be putting posting them in the chat box and we can pick them up at the end so it's important to recognize i think that actually like i just said about farms all land is also unique so it has its own combination of constraints and they're usually considered as those bullet points down the left hand side those are the things that are used to give land its um, capability value uh, its alc classification and pieces of land might have similar constraints but actually those pieces of land won't be the same as each other even with the same alc classification or even um in adjacent fields we can see very different land quality um, as a result of those fixed factors that we can't change it's a bit like the weather climate obviously is just the average weather over a very long time those are factors that we just have to learn to live with and those are the things that define the character of our land and soil type defines those inherent limits that belong to the soil the depth the stoniness the texture the minerals that are there and they tell us something about the soil they give it give us its background it's the things that we can't change i'm calling that the soil character and it's important that we know about that but we're also got a lot of properties that are changed by the way that the soil and the land are used. Management can modify the structure, the nutrients, the earthworms, and those are the properties that together are considered to, to represent soil health. Those ones that we can manage and actually putting the soil in the best condition it can be given its character is what we're trying to achieve. So it's like me training properly and sensibly to run the Grey North Run not that I've done it for 10 years, I can put myself in the best possible health given the constraints I have of being short and northern and a girl, I guess, in terms of how fast I might be able to run um, that Great North Run. It wasn't very fast, I promise. So soil health really then is about starting by knowing our character. So we do need to know about our soil and don't forget the subsoil there. Now, this is one of those things we can just get to know. And people who've usually worked and lived on land for a long time already know more about their soil than any scientist. We can access maps at a range of scales that can tell us things like the soil series name. And often farmers know the names of the soil on their farm in the same way as um, crops, grass, are divided in, into varieties so soils are divided up into what are called series and that means we can read about that series and find some of the useful information about the character of that soil not its health but the things that that soil type will always do so an example of that is just to quickly hear uh, the salop series so this is a common series in lowland uk very commonly in grassland systems. This is the kind of information we might be able to quickly access if we know that we've got a soil that is of this series. We can find pictures of it, which helps us because we can cross check whether that's actually what we really have got. Part of the problem though with accessing this information and some of you have been scanning those boxes on the right hand side as I've just been wittering on, is that the terminology used is soil science, a whole different language. So what is a stagnant lay? What do we mean by clay enriched? What, what's going on with prominently mottled? There are technical jargon and terms in there that don't necessarily help us. And so, although this information is accessible, it isn't always very useful. And so there are some guides and help in helping us to understand and interpret that through um, people like the British Grassland Society and um, through online tools such as the um, Landis Soil Explorer. But we're focusing here much more on soil health than on that character. So we need to remember that soil is a natural body, that actually it's the result of those interactions between the vegetation and the parent material and the climate above ground. So that actually we can't easily separate 
the soil from those factors around it. And Kubiena does a marvellous job of drawing pictures that show how those interactions work in different soils and different types of soils. The focus more recently has been taking us away from the basic physics and chemistry of soil, not to say that they're not important, but to remind us that this soil is alive, that the above ground photosynthesis feeds a below ground life. So there's lots of life in a soil and the numbers on the jar um, are of a, just a typical uh, pasture soil in grass clover um, that was set up ready for um, and the analysis was done for that cover. And, um, it's true, there are 12 noughts on that number of bacteria that are in that particular jar of soil, and there are 25 uh, to 50,000 individual nematodes of something like seven or eight, or perhaps even more species. And the one that always gets me, six miles, 1,000, 10,000 meters, 10 kilometers of fungal hyphae within that one kilner jar. So we've got huge diversity of species hanging out in interesting places. So a bit like in the village, the park bench or the fish and chip shop are where the teenagers tend to gather. And that's the same in soil, that the organisms hang out where something interesting is happening, often around the roots, because the roots are the sources, the places that the sun's energy is drip fed as sugars to feed that below ground community. But a high proportion of the population below ground are a bit like me, dormant, not really very active, especially at night, sitting behind my door, watching the television, just waiting for something interesting to happen. There are specialists there, but actually also a lot of those organisms can share the roles out. Many of the different organisms have the enzymatic capacity to break down organic matter. They need to be able to do that, to digest the organic compounds in the soil to access the energy they need to live. So this focus on soil life has changed a little bit the way we talk about soils. It's why the term soil health has come to use. The diverse communities are equally diverse, equally different and equally distinct in different land use systems. So if we compare here just a snapshot again with hand drawn pictures, beautifully done by in a, in, in a book from uh, 1988. The same sorts of organisms occur in the UK as in New Zealand, with this real mixing of organic matter through the soil in the grass clover lay to the right, compared with the stratification of um, organic matter in the woodland to the left. But the same sorts of organisms, more of them under woodland, but the same diversity of organisms in the grassland soil to the right fed by the above ground inputs of manures and the roots feeding the carbon through the system. It, some organisms directly interacting with the plant roots um, and others living on their own out there in the soil, but responding to the inputs that they receive. So we've got then this typical soil science thing, a sort of triangle of thinking, a chemistry, physics and biology, and deliberately drawn so that the chemistry and the physics are the foundation on which the biology then um, responds. Because if we get the chemistry and the physics right, if we make the habitat right for the organisms in the soil, they will flourish and do their thing. So getting soils in good health for grassland management is around optimizing those conditions, not actually for the biology, the organisms I've just shown you, but for the plant roots. And that matters for the rest of the biology too, because if the plant's able to grow well and photosynthesize and make best use of whatever sunshine is available, it will feed those organisms. So it becomes a virtuous circle. So maintaining soils in good condition for plant growth is a bonus, is, is what the below ground biology needs. So I don't apologise for talking about soil health and soil biology and starting by saying pH really matters. You've heard the economics of that and it's true that many grassland soils are below pH 6. And that's often because pH 6 is sort of where farmers think that soils should be 
on average across the rotation, where actually what's true is the soil should never drop below pH 6. We shouldn't be liming just to get to 6. What we should be doing is thinking about managing our liming input so the soil pH never drops below 6. And it's also important that we provide the plant the other nutrients it needs at the right amount in the right place at the right time. And there's a bullet point in, in all the, in, in these two bottom boxes that's about knowing the character of the soil. Because the way that we manage a soil that is very sandy with low cation exchange capacity, low ability to hold on to the nutrients we add, is very different than the way we would target management on a heavier soil. And knowing what minerals there are in the soil can really critically affect how we manage and address um, the micronutrient needs of livestock. So it's really important not just to manage our soil healthily, but to understand the character there that is giving us the background against which we operate. It's fine to have the chemistry right, but it's no good if the physics is rubbish. So if the plant roots can't explore the soil, it doesn't really matter how good the soil is. They need to be able to access pore space and then extend themselves and create that network through the soil. So optimising the water balance, getting the drainage right, cleaning and maintaining drains and ditches so that the pore space in the soil can have that right balance of air and water, even if you happen to live in one of the wettest parts of the country. Or if you live in one of the drier areas, having that pore space, the same balance that allows it to hold on to water, even through those periods into May, though not as far as June, when things started to run short of water and that water deficit went up towards the 140. Improving your soil structure is, is a, works with that and that's something that farmers have a lot of control over, making sure that pore space that's in soil is effective and continuous. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But if we get that chemistry and that physics right so the plants grow well, we will be feeding the soil regularly through our grass, our clovers and our herbal lays if we're growing something that's more diverse. And I guess the third point on that biological slide there is, is where that diversity of root systems, of above ground systems from a herbal lay, a more diverse lay, perhaps just a grass clover lay, is important and we see the benefits of that diversity below ground. In grassland systems it's relatively rare, usually only associated with a reseed, to do very intensive tillage. But notice that the guiding principle here isn't that we shouldn't move soil, but that we should move it only when we have to. And it might be necessary to fix compaction by moving soil, even if we do it very gently. So let's start with the chemical analysis, the need to understand what we've got in the soil so as we can meet those principles. And the routine soil analysis is pretty good. PH, P, Ks and Mgs give us the baseline for making sensible fertility management decisions. We can add on more tests and for some people testing organic matter is important to understand what is being held and supported in the soil. Micronutrients possibly are a test you might think about adding or calcium. But for micronutrients it's important that we start with forage analysis. I'm a soil scientist but Start by looking at what's in the forage first. The micronutrient balance of the soil is really quite complex and, and interactive. And actually plants can sometimes access micronutrients that don't seem to be available when we do soil analysis. So if we're concerned about a micronutrient deficiency or managing the micronutrients for livestock, I would start with the livestock and with the forage and only look at the soil once I've got a good and once you've got a good understanding of those things. So what about targets? I've had those tests done. What should I be aiming for? I've already said something about pH. The recommended pH is to keep pH above six, never to let it fall below. And that will mean setting a target. The PT soils, that's not possible. And the target is set lower. In terms of soil nutrient reserves, there is really good evidence that maintaining the 
bottom end of index two and a good level of magnesium is important, particularly uh, in terms of, of managing that hypermagnesemia staggers. And the index two minus for K is standard for most soils, but if you've got a soil that's got a very low cation exchange capacity, it won't be possible to meet that target. What's more important is that those things are being measured regularly and we're looking for changes in those targets. And you're now required, we're, all farmers are required on land that receives fertiliser to be making soil analysis at least every five years in the farming rules for water. And that's about the right sort of timing to be regularly looking at nutrient reserves and pH. And so those things can be built together to set good nutrient management plans. It's important to recognise that we also need enough calcium. There's no special magic balance number for calcium and magnesium in UK soils. Our soils are too diverse to give one number that works on all soils. But it is true that enough calcium and enough magnesium are required to meet plant and livestock requirements. So it might be important if you're on a soil that is not over calcium to bring in calcium lime and not magnesium lime. It, it might be important to think about your liming material, not just in terms of its ability to manage pH, but also in terms of its ability to meet some of the demands for supplying calcium and magnesium. And it is possible, of course, to top both up directly in other ways. The key important thing here is that we need to balance those inputs and outputs at the rotational level for each field. Five years is, is, is absolutely as far as you should go, even if there wasn't a, a law, a, a piece of legislation now governing that. Three years, probably even better, but it should match into the policy of the farm and be something you use to guide management. So you should be doing it in a way that helps you understand whether the management you have in place is delivering what you expect. In terms of physical, that's really tricky to measure for scientists. So actually the best way to measure it is to dig a hole and have a look. So field assessment is needed. In this context, the best tool is the combination of spade and hands. We take out a block of soil and then we break that block open and make a judgment. And the tools that you need to do that are being really well developed by um, AHDB. And I thought they were on the next slide, but they're not. The next slide you've got a preview of is to remind you, though, that actually here, one of the things you will be looking for when you handle soil is whether it's got the right water balance. And there's the soil it's got a built-in check on that one. If a soil sits wet a lot of the time, it will start to oof, whiff and smell. And it will start to turn a sort of grey green colour. And where air gets back into the soil, usually down roots, it will then start to reoxidize and you'll get rusty mottles. So a soil that is slowly or poorly draining will be a dominantly grey colour with rusty mottles. Now that might be something you can do something about by checking your drains, keeping them clear and maintained, perhaps collaborating with your neighbours, but equally on some soil types where there's a naturally high water table it might just be one of those things that you're going to have to learn to live with and know that that soil can only be used in the driest times of the year for example. Here's the Healthy Grassland Soils card developed as part of a project funded by AHDB now quite a long time ago um, to give farmers a very practical tool to use with their soils. So it's a two-sided, you can download it if you want, you can also still obtain it from AHDB and they send it you as a sort of plasticized card so you can take it into the field, that's what it's designed for. It comes with a little pocket book that gives you more detail but actually this card is, is all you really need. It guides you through surface assessment and looking for surface structures and guiding you to think about where you might take the sample. And on the back of the card, it takes you through the what you should be looking for. And I think on that block that we've got taken out there from a, a dairy site um, in Northumberland, you can see what happens when a soil has been um, walked over 
constantly. It's a gateway soil uh, versus silty clay loam texture. So it's showing a classic compaction layer. So our soil really naturally wants this open structure, the one on the left of the diagram there. But as it becomes compacted, what happens is that those soil aggregates or blocks become compressed and we start to get much more horizontal lines when we break open the block. Compaction is a real issue in grassland soils. ADAS work showed that around 70% of soils showed some limitation in rooting due to compaction. And that's because the roots, you can see it there in that, that cartoon diagram, struggle. They've got to go a lot further and work a lot harder to get through the layer where the blocks are compact than where they're not. And so that means that the soil roots and the roots of the grass are only able to see a proportion of the nutrients that are there. They've only got a proportion of the soil available to them. So compacted soils dry out more quickly, or at least they appear to. They can be very wet at depth, but the plant roots aren't able to access the water. We need to just also recognise that it, it's not as simple as saying I've got compaction, I need to, to take this piece of kit out. Because compaction occurs at different levels for different reasons. So we're going to get the compaction most likely to occur in wet soil and where there's a physical force um, imposed on it. And obviously the physical force reaches deeper into the soil, the heavier the thing above ground. So I don't cause as much compaction as a cow, but I still cause some compaction. And under a tractor wheel or the wheel of a silage trailer, we cause more potential depth of compaction. So it's important before we begin to think about remediating compaction to understand where in the profile it is. Because different tools will address compaction at different depths. So an aerator is dominantly going to be able to deal with a kind of compaction that's been um, created by the feet of sheep, certainly by the feet of humans, and most of the damage, as long as the grazing pressure isn't too high, caused by the feet of cows. It's, it's operating as a slitter dominantly and opening up those blocky structures. Sward lifters and subsoilers, whether a grassland subsoiler or a, um, an arable subsoiler during a reseed, operate in a slightly different way. And the, at that point, the tines need to be underneath the zone of compaction. So we need to know where that is pretty exactly to be able to set that machine up to do the job that we want it to. So it's really important to recognise that different types of compaction will be caused by different weights and timings of machinery, and that we'll need to use different tools to address them. So we need to, well, yeah, get a spade out to have a look and see where the problem is and how we might address it. I think it's also important to recognise that we cause compaction often when the surface of the soil looks fine. Um, the, the biggest problems with compaction don't occur around about this time of the year as the soil is wetting up because the surface of the soil is the one that gets wet first and underneath will continue to be dry. The biggest problems occur in the spring where the soil is drying out and the surface can begin to dry and actually look like it will hold and it often won't be um, broken up at the surface, either poached or um, cut by tyres. And we will still be getting compaction at depth because the soil is still wet at 30 or 40 centimetres. So it's really important not to just say, oh, I can't see any, any physical damage at the surface, so I don't have a problem with compaction. It's important to look too at how water moves. So it's May and June are often good times, if there is any rain, which there wasn't this year, to have a look and see how those soils are coping with um, intense rainstorms. So we've done chemistry and we've done physics and actually the principles for biology pretty much say if you get the physics and chemistry right, if you build it, then the biology will respond. So getting the things, getting the physics and chemistry right so that plants grow well means that dominantly we will meet the needs of the biology below ground. 
how can we look at that and assess it? Well, perhaps the most common way to do that is to look at worm numbers, not just how many worms, but also the types of worms that are there. And on that sheet, a farmer who was um, doing an assessment with me has laid out his worms into their different types, which is simply on their size. So the smallest matchstick worms are the ones that live on the surface. They work on the plant litter as it literally just falls off the grass leaves as they fall to the soil surface. Lit dwelling in the soil topsoil down to about 20 to 30 centimetres are a set of earthworms that are called endogeic. They live in the soil and don't ever come out. So they're ones that eat and burrow through that top layer, mixing and um, manipulating it and creating that biological structure. The ones at the bottom there, the deeper ones, um, are the bigger ones, are the deeper burrowing earthworms, and they make vertical channels. And we recognize them dominantly by the fact that there are those worm casts at the surface. So they come to the surface and take out the litter, grass leaves and so on from the top, and then take them down into their burrows. And then as they come to the surface, they leave that cast at the top. So how might we increase or improve our biology indicated by those earthworms, but they're just a part of the system as I've shown you. The principles are exactly the same whether we're working in a livestock system or in an arable system, but actually the opportunities we have will be different. So increasing our organic matter returns in plants will mean maximising rooting and residue returns. So that's one of the approaches that the mob grazing approach takes in terms of making sure more residue is returned to the soil. But actually also how manure is used is important here. And there is a real benefit to soil organic matter and soil biology from using more solid man manures um, rather than liquid slurries. So there are some clear benefits there. They're, they're, they may be very costly to deliver um, in terms of the whole structural change of, of livestock housing, but there, there are some clear benefits. Diversification of crop rotations, but perhaps more importantly, thinking about mixed whole crop silages in livestock systems and mixed species swards for grazing and conservation. And perhaps something that will come even more into our minds in terms of thinking about whether we can create opportunities to put trees back into pastures in a way that makes sense. Um, not just using hedges effectively, but thinking about that, what's called silvo pastoral, forest pastoral systems. So agroforestry systems, again, high capital demand, but potentially valuable if we can make them work well in our systems. And moving soil only when we have to is actually also about limiting compaction, dealing with that compaction where we need to, and considering, though it can be tricky to deliver, the use of overseeding rather than plough based systems for lay uh, rejuvenation for reseeds. But there, if we have a compaction problem, it can be our only opportunity to redress it. And so getting the physical system right is important and we might need to use cultivations at the point of a reseed to reset the biological processes of soil structure formation. So I lead for uh, the great, uh, so within the Great Soils programme of AHDB, this Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. It's a joint programme of research and knowledge exchange putting together materials for people. And what we focused on doing is developing some of the tools that might be used by farmers to better understand their soil health. And in that context, it becomes really important that we don't just sample for chemistry, we go and get our mud and send it away for analysis, but that we start to link that to what we see with the spade and the biological assessments at the same time. So that's going to need a different approach to sample collection, linking our physical observations and those soil samples sent for testing. We're beginning, we're, we're, we began in 2017, we'll finish at the end of 2021, so we've just got over a year to go. So we've been working on the approach that that might look like and trialling it with some farmers, some of whom you never know might be on the call, to just check that it does make sense. And we're looking at providing that information in this kind of scorecard system. And this is, is gaining interest and wider application, and in fact, um, AHDB monitor farms for beef and sheep will be trialling this um, 
on the Grantham monitor farm this year and the arable monitor farms have, have, are now in their second year of trialing this approach just thought i'd show you one set of scorecards because it's it it helps to just link up that point that i was making around the use of farmyard manure compared to slurry so we've got here is a long-term experiment it's an experiment at harper adams where we've made the scorecard assessment um, here looking at the physical chemical and biological properties all together and as well as reporting their numbers highlighting them using this traffic light approach where actually green as you'd expect means good there's no particular action needed but where things flag up in amber that means that more monitoring more intense look might be needed it's a bit like when um, i go to uh, get my uh, MOT on my car done, things come back as advisories. Doesn't mean they've had to be fixed, but actually it might be worth having a look. Or perhaps when I go to the, um, the GP for my routine health check, they send me away with some things to look at or continue to monitor, usually how much cake I'm eating. Red is directing us to look at that a bit more carefully. And it, it, remembering that these samples are coming from one look at one time, what that might mean is just going back and resampling and just checking the numbers are right. On this site, all of the phosphorus, the exchangeable phosphorus numbers, are flagging amber or red. Red where farmyard manure has been applied for 23 years, and amber even where no additional materials have been applied on the control. And that's because this site naturally has very high phosphorus levels. So the flag here is for a risk that if this soil were to move into water courses, it would be a problem. So it's an environmental flag, not just a production one. And the, the detail that goes with that, not just the colouring in, but the information makes it clear when it's a, a risk because something's too high compared to too low. In contrast for magnesium here on the control, the soil is very low in magnesium and actually the regular additions of organic materials in farmyard manure or slurry or the composts used here have increased that magnesium level. Visual assessment of soil structure is that healthy grassland soil here all scoring well on this sandy soil. But the point is not really to show you the scores but to show you actually the kind of way of presenting the data and the way it's designed to try and just make that accessible to try and think more about these properties and processes. But don't forget too that you've got some really good resources available to you. I'm sure all of you have got your Improving Soil for Better Returns guide and actually the rest of AHDB are now catching up because the Principles for Soil Management guide that is being developed in the last year to pick the very best of the materials that are otherwise available and provide perhaps some extra detail compared to improving soils for better returns. But both are important guides in terms of thinking about how to manage soil and manage it well going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that really interesting presentation. Um, just while I'm waiting for some questions to come in, and just to remind everyone, you can type your questions in your question or chat box um, at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, also, just to remind people that tonight's webinar has been recorded and will, av will be available to watch back in due course. Okay, so a few questions are coming in already. So I've got uh, the first question has come through um, for you, Kat, um, and that is asking, um, how often is the weather data and the soil moisture data um, updated through GrassCheck TV, and where can people access that data? Hey, um, so those weather stations, they're actually um, providing live feeds to us. So it's updating online every minute, I think. Um, unfortunately, the way that the system is set up and it's outside of our control, it's just the way the manufacturers have got it set up. Um, we can't provide access to live soil moisture readings for you guys. Um, so those, um, but you can find the updated ones in the weekly bulletins. Um, and they are quite specific to soil types. So unless you know exactly what 
you also type is and whether it's comparable to a local farm, you're probably better looking at the regional averages and just looking at those trends through the year anyway. Um, but if you want to look at local rainfall and local weather data, uh, there's a feed to all of the stations in uh, a page on the website. There's, I think there's a tab for the weather stations. I can find that link in a minute. Um, and also the, the Davis uh, Pro 2 weather stations. So if you wanted to get an app, uh, there's a weather link app that you can download and you can search for grass check. And there's a number of stations in there and it's grass check numbers 51 to 101 are stations that are based in GB. Great, thanks, Kat. Um, the next question um, is for Elizabeth. Hi, how would we? How would you advise to reduce soil pH that is currently greater than eight? Tricky. I'm guessing, and I, the, the person might want to respond. It, it depends a little bit whether that's because you're farming over limestone where actually the rock underneath is at pH 9 or something as a, as a limestone or chalk would be and just keeping that pH very high. In that context actually grasslands in, in those on those soils are thought to be very valuable. They used to be very highly prized for downland sheep in terms of quality but it, it, it constrains, it does constrain yield potentially. Um, there isn't a lot you can do, but luckily the plant roots do it. So actually in those situations, what the calcium adapted, the grasses that are adapted to grow in those environments do is exude an acid around their roots. And they actually make the pH around themselves back more like six. Other plants do it too. And there are, it's one of the reasons that a, especially a seed merchant would, or would I would hope, would ask you, do, do you have a very calcium rich, a, a chalky, limestoney grass uh, ground? And they would give you a mix that suited that when they were um, selecting for you. If it's pH that's drifted up because of management, and that sometimes happens with big applications of, of compost or other materials unintentionally, there are again there isn't a lot you can do apart from let nature take its course so in that case you have to just stop making those applications and the ph itself will drift back down because rainfall is naturally acid so soils tend where there isn't an underlying line to offset that to drift down it's why many soils in the uk tend to drift around those phs of fives so land at ph8 is tricky to manage it's often naturally that and is something that becomes part of the soil character, something we have to live with and think about tailing our both our grass choices and our fertiliser management to the pH. So I'm not sure I helped. So um, I'm sorry that I can't help mostly in that context. Great, thank you Elizabeth. A nice easy one to start with. So the next question is, what farm practices in grassland graze and cutting will optimise carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration is tricky because sequestration merely means locking carbon up for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm saying it's tricky because the carbon that we lock up has to be carbon that is new in the system. So manures, for example, the carbon, although they increase the carbon in the soil, that doesn't count as sequestration. Seems a bit odd, then we're storing more carbon in the soil, but that doesn't count as sequestration. The use of sewage sludge on soils isn't sequestration because that's carbon that comes from our food source and is in part of, it's part of the natural cycle. So it's actually quite a tricky one. I think perhaps more important for farming is to have a conversation about having good organic matter levels. It's nearly the same thing, but not quite. And so getting the balance right there for organic matter, I like to think of about a bit like um, getting my bank balance in a good state, because it's very similar. If I pay more money into my bank, the chances are my balance will go up. So if I put more carbon into the soil, whether I grow more crops or grow the crops, the grass that I've got more effectively so that I capture more of the sun's energy 
through photosynthesis, actually my bank balance of the carbon in the soil will go up. That's offset by any losses. And in that context, my bank balance doesn't normally go up when I pay more money in because that's usually because I've got, I go, oh, I've just got a, this uh, extra money coming in. I'll have one of these and I go and spend it. So actually, if I do things to the soil, usually in that context, to disturb it and to get it break, the organic matter breaking down more quickly, then actually I will lose organic matter from the system. So a key point for grassland systems where organic matter is at great risk of being lost is when that sward is broken at a, a point of reseed. It's one of the reasons that there's that bit of advice that's tricky to deliver for if you can reseed without a big cultivation operation do that but it's absolutely about balance and i think any grazing system that optimizes the the growth of the grass so the over the whole season does a good job it's improved the photosynthesis and although we might we take the surface off through grazing actually something like 50 percent of the photosynthetic carbon is captured and goes into the roots if you have a system that's returning more of that to the soil and that's what the approach of mob grazing is doing we're paying more carbon into the system so we're we're then making that bank balance bigger by putting more carbon in we if we bring in compost from outside the farm if we add manures so in some ways it's a very easy question to answer because it is simply about what can we do to improve the inputs more inputs in which dominantly in grassland system means growing better grass growing grass for longer and really using that photosynthesis so making sure no other constraints whether it's ph or p or k are holding back grass production actually is a really positive thing for carbon in the soil too and that increased photosynthesis is actually also considered to be a positive benefit in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of carbon sequestration. Great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Can we source compaction without the use of diesel and methyl? And that question is from John. I think if we have caused compaction, it can be tricky to fix it without, but it is of course possible if soils aren't compacted to keep them uncompacted by good management and that's got to be our aim so our aim shouldn't be to 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 basically go through a cycle where we cause compaction and then have to fix it our aim should be to actually work with the soils and that's very a bit awareness of moisture condition and everything else in terms of how we're using the ground and some years that just doesn't work for us we we have to do damage to, otherwise we have no nowhere for livestock to be for example but once we have caused compaction it if it is serious and that's where the spade helps us so the spade helps us because we can look if the plant roots are able still to get through our soil even though it's got some evidence of compaction in it i probably don't need to put metal through in fact the metal might end up causing more damage because if i again roll the tractor over at the wrong time i can cause more compaction while i'm trying to fix the compaction that's there so it's very much about looking at the particular situation we've got and then saying what what's the least i need to do and what's the the soil condition needs to be right to, for the operation to be successful so if i do have to invest in diesel and metal i want to use it as effectively as i can once i have fixed compaction good rooting and good deep rooting can build resilience into my system but i can't get roots to go through an incredibly compact layer they're just wusses they they docks are probably your best fixers of compaction they'll go through the the toughest layer but i don't think any of you are, are planning on growing docks as a as a crop to to fix your compaction so it even then they they are a bit of a wuss they will bend the fix so it's actually better if there's a really bad problem to fix it 
and then to operate in a way that doesn't cause it again. So my ideal farm doesn't have to fix compaction, doesn't use metal or diesel to fix compaction, not because they have other ways to fix compaction, but because they never cause it in the first place. Thanks, Robert. Um, what do you think about using cumate and drop to increase soil biology? There are lots of possible extra tools that we can encourage biology on with. So, uh, if, if, so it's the same. If I'm falling asleep, I can keep myself awake. I sometimes do it by eating jelly babies. Um, that gives me some extra fuel to keep me going. It stimulates me for a little while. But if I constantly ate jelly babies, I wouldn't. I certainly would get told off the next time I went to the doctors. So sometimes additions, and there are a whole variety of them, can stimulate the biology to get it through a particular phase or to get it kick-started just at the right time. And that can be particularly important, and it, it's very unusual in grassland systems, but where a soil is very overworked, um, there are a lot of um, horticultural soils that are probably cultivated three or four times a year, and sometimes even they use soil sterilizers on those. And in those situations, sometimes those kind of additions can have a really positive benefit. In general, I don't need jelly babies. And in general, the soil biological community, if we get the physics and the chemistry right and we do the feeding through the plants, we grow our grass, our lays well, the extra benefit that we will see from some of the, those additions disappears. They, they don't have the benefit. But, so it's a tricky one because they can have a short term marked difference in some situations. So I'm not saying they're silly or don't ever use them. But most of the time, the sensible thing to do is the long-term thing that puts everything into good health. I really should eat, if I, the times I need jelly babies, I probably should have eaten better at lunchtime and then I wouldn't have needed the jelly babies. So having some longer-term structure plan, thinking about my use of manures, getting my pH right, perhaps a diverse lay, will all give me the benefits actually a quick fix can't sustain so long they the simple answer is they can have some benefits but actually the longer term system things are more important to get right that balance of the whole triangle is is, is the way to go if you can do it great thank you and um, just carrying on the theme of the cumate i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly correct if i'm not and um, there's another question in terms of building phosphorus and potassium index on grazing grassland would you recommend on the use of soluble humates granules mixed with slurry um for p and k that would be about holding the nutrients that are in the slurry more effectively in the soil so it would be about slowing them there and the, the cycling of them down a little bit that, that management practice so as to as we say to build the index rather than to have them move through the system quickly um there again i think the key for building indices is a bit like building organic matter if i put on more p or k then there is <clears throat> that I take off, I will tend to build the index. If I put on less than I take off, I will tend to bring the index down again, just like my bank balance. I take more out than I've paid in, it will go down. So the key really is then uh, the, the kind of management we're talking about there with slurry is about just managing or manipulating the availability within the slurry. And there are a number of possibilities for that. But actually, just knowing how much P and K you've got in your slurry is a really good start. And for most people, things like analysing the organic manures and slurries you're using isn't a common thing to do. So we, we had data at the beginning that reminded us that it isn't very common for people to analyse their soils. It's probably even less common for people to be analysing their muck. So analysing your muck and just knowing how much P and K you're putting back as well as knowing or getting an understanding of what's coming out of the system 
through the grazing and and to, so getting that understanding of the balance is is more important than 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 those little little managements but once i've got the basics right i do have the opportunity to use those some of those targeted extra things like you mates with slurry and and things like slurry bugs to make my slurry a more amenable product but actually the pr the basic principles are the more important ones you can't fix things that you don't know about so measure how much p and k is in your slurry and in your applications that's that's the most important thing great thank you and just on the note of testing slurry or farmyard manure hdb do have two how to videos and i did highlight how to do that in a safely manner and so we'll find the link through the next question and add them to the chat box and um, continuing on the slurry and farmyard manure theme although it is physically and logistically convenient to separate liquid from solids does this lead to problems to soil microfauna when applying liquids um so <clears throat> Like all questions, it is answered with an it depends answer. So no soil organism likes salty water, especially not very salty water. And soils in general don't like salty water. If we, if we happen to live near the sea and get inundated by the sea, it absolutely ruins soil in a second. So it, the concentrated liquid is slurry and i'm not talking about dirty water i'm talking about the concentrated liquid with slurry acts a bit like that for a short period of time unless of course it rains fairly quickly afterwards and and then it gets diluted and so that can have that disruptive effect and what you what we often see with particularly big rates of application is things like worms coming to the surface not because they're drowned but because they're desperately trying to get away from that salty water because a bit like putting salt on slugs what it does to those soil organisms is actually disrupt their osmotic regulation it changes how their bodies work and they basically just trying to desperately get away from it as they come to the surface and so we disrupt but for a short period of time the best approach there is 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 not to not use it but to think about the rate at which we are which we are using it so a not very concentrated not very much so rather than having a very big application of slurry to have two smaller ones will do have less impact so although they have an impact they have an impact short term dominantly um, and it's about managing those things carefully and particularly thinking about rate and timing. Great, thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of the question. So if anyone ha else has a question, please type in your question now. Um, soils in mid Wales are often naturally very high in magnesium, for example, in the four and five. Any suggestions how this may be managed? So two things you'll need to be very careful with potassium so you don't want your potassium level to be too low so you need to be con to be looking at that to make sure there is sufficient potassium otherwise the magnesium will um, interfere and that can cause real problems for livestock and the other is your calcium similarly but less noticeable in livestock directly but in the the balance of the forage. So if I know I've got a very high magnesium, I'm uh, to pay quite close attention to the, not that it is the balance, but to make sure I've got enough of the other nutrients. And, and actually, and it can happen with, if the calcium's too high, the same will happen backwards. So if, my, if I'm on the soil, my pH eight with very high calcium, then actually I've got to be very careful to have my magnesium at a good, level at properly sufficient levels so the important is to know that i've got that my character of my soils is to have high magnesium therefore because i know that i need to now pay attention to having good levels of calcium which sometimes we don't measure so it's it can be useful in those soils to just measure that at least a couple of times to make sure it's in that very good level 
and potassium that we do measure more often. There's nothing magic happens there when we get that balance right, but and high magnesium soils are sometimes associated with sticky clay, and that's not the magnesium, it just happens that both tend to turn up together. Um, in mid Wales, that isn't so much an issue, but those soils are often quite silty, which means they also cap and don't have good structural stability. So their regular additions of a composted organic material will also improve the structural stability. Again, not the magnesium, but the character of the soil that we just need to address. Great, thank you. And there's a few more questions that are sneaking in. So we'll go through these last three and then we'll call it an evening because um, we have gone over time. So is there a best time to test soils? Is there a off time for the soil sample? Um, no, if you're going to do that sort of complete soil health thing, worms are the thing that, that has the most variation through the year. And so we are looking at recommending sampling in the autumn as it wets up. So late September into October, depending on where in the country you are. Obviously in Wales, it never dries out. So you're never in danger or in spring. Um, as the soil is drying out, so March, April, both those times are good. That kind of optimizes all those physical, chemical and biological things together. The more important thing is that if you are testing soil, that you do it with the soil in the same conditions and that roughly the same time of year. It's more important that the soil's under the same condition than it is that it's exactly the same time of year. So it isn't that you put a note in your diary on the 1st of March and you go out and sample. It could be three feet of snow one year and dry as a bone the next and you wonder why you get different numbers. It's not about a date in the calendar, but as the soil is either wetting or drying is, is a good time to do it. But the most important thing is that you do it in the same way. So you choose the soil depth, you choose this way you collect the sample and you do that each time so that you can make the comparison and keep good notes. So one of the things that, we, that um, I often find with farmer soil analysis is they've stored it really carefully because it's in that pile in the corner of the farm office. You see that pile over there? That's all my soil analysis. Um, but actually with that, I say, well, this, is the, this number looks a little bit odd. Was it really dry when you sampled? Oh, I can't remember that. So actually keeping a few notes, even if you just scribble them on the, 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 the pile of papers in the corner to remind you what the conditions were like when you sampled. It had been very dry and then I sampled or it had been a very wet autumn it can be really useful when you go back and look at those um, records. Thank you. Um, hopefully a quick question. Is there an optimum pH for clover and other herbal lights? Um, the, the pH of six to six, so arable farmers work to six and a half. Um, grassland tends to be six, but actually clover gets a little bit happier at that little bit higher pH. But some some plants in herbal lays can cope with 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 below six. So it's one of those things that actually you would look at what your target pH was, and you should be taking advice what should be in your herbal lay mix to match your soil. You, you That should be a process you go through with your seed merchant or even just yourself to have a think about what's in there. Um, if For clovers, I would be pushing up, I, be, I would be saying definitely don't drop below six. I might even be pushing saying oh, 6.2, 6.3, I'd be happier there. Um, but you don't want to push too high because you then start to restrict phosphorus availability. So it's a tricky one to get right. So six to six and a half. If you can keep, and not everyone can, because not every soil will, keep your pH in that six to six and a half range all the time. It doesn't move a lot. Everything will be at its most happy. But as I say, some of you will just never be able to achieve that on very sandy soils, soils over chalk with their very high pHs. Each soil is an individual. You have to know its character and then manage it as best you can or as least worst you can to optimise its health. And a bit like me and my cake. I still eat cake. I know it's not very good for me, but actually sometimes I do. And sometimes actually equally with farming, 
and in, in the that we we're required to do we have to do for the good of our livestock things that aren't good for our soil we should just know about that we should notice we've done it and then build in the steps that we can to address that and then try through the rest of the cycle to build the resilience into our soils that that means that we don't the next time that thing happens it it doesn't do as much damage so that combination of knowing our soil's character and then managing our soil's health the best we can in our system is what's key. Great, thank you. And before I move on to the last question for tonight, this is Shameless Plug, but A to B um, alongside British Grassland Society are holding a panel discussion on herbal ways next Tuesday, um, 22nd September. You can find details on HTV social media platforms or on our um, events page. So for those that are interested in that, please take a look. So the last question, Elizabeth, is livestock grazing soils and optimum soil pH. Would you recommend calcium or magnesium? Which one would have the biggest effect? And then the second part of the question, is it true that you should in line then apply the fertilizers soon after? So I'll do the second bit first. Yes, actually that combination means that the phosphorus is less available. So phosphorus is most available between pHs six and six and a half. It's one of the reasons that that pH is, is optimum for lots of things. But obviously in the vicinity of liming granules the pH is a lot higher and that tends to lock up the phosphorus so if you can kind of separate to opposite ends of the management cycle any phosphorus additions and lime you'll get the best benefit out of both so that's the easy bit um the harder bit is the it depends bit at the beginning should i apply calcium or magnesium lime well it depends I think just to notice that most magnesium lime actually also contains some calcium. So you, even if you're using a magnesium limestone, it contains calcium, so you will get some calcium. If you are naturally on a soil that's got a magnesium index of four or five, you shouldn't be using magnesium lime. Even if it's more expensive, I would be using calcium only lime because it addresses the pH issue without further increasing or challenging the magnesium. The opposite can be true. I can be on a very calcium rich soil without very much magnesium and then a magnesium line can be a really good way of bringing magnesium into the system. You might have told me and I wasn't listening enough, Shuan, to know which of those situations the questioner was in, but the way I heard it, it was a, a more general question. Yeah, it was more general. Yeah, so it's, so it's, 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 it depends. depends. Yeah. Choose the one that actually is what your system really needs. Choose a line material that gives you the right um, liming benefits, but a name that's gone completely out of my head. Um, but the, the, the sometimes you want a fast reaction, sometimes you want a slow reaction. So do think about that but also think about the type of lime you're using if you pay you have you have to pay a little bit more to get the lime you need you will gain the benefit from that it's not just any old lime will do that's cheaper it's about getting the lime that works for your situation great thank you okay. Uh, you've answered the question, so the person that asked the question has just come and say that you've answered the question, so thank you. Um, so on that, we've managed to go through all the questions, and I'd just like to thank you all for listening tonight. We've had a great turnout and participation in the webinar. Um, a very special thank you to Kath and Elizabeth for presenting tonight. Um, it's been really interesting to listen to you, and we've had a good Q&A session at the end as well. Please keep an eye out for the recording, which will be sent out to you hopefully tomorrow. All of those that have registered will receive an email to alert them when that is available online. So on that note, I'll just thank you all and wish you a good night.